Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mengs, and it's time to continue with part 2 of our Spotlight on Ike. Uh, if you aren't aware, this is a continuation of a previous Spotlight, the first one of its kind. If you haven't checked it out yet, you should definitely watch the Path of Radiant Spotlight first, before watching this one. Also, I almost never say this at the start of my Spotlights, because I think it goes without saying, but I'll mention it anyway. There will be heavy spoilers for Radiant Dawn in this video, so if you haven't beaten the game yet, I highly advise you click away from this video right now. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump into the Spotlight on Radiant Dawn Ike. Thanks to all! After his victory in the war against the Mad King Ashnard of Burn, Ike was given noble status by Elincia and a seat at her court, but his disdain for politics and backstabbings made Ike resent his new life as a noble, and after a short while, he resigned his status to resume his role as the leader of the Grail mercenaries. Many years later, Ike was contacted by the Count of Fair, Bastion, who informed Ike that dude Ludwig of Felere was plotting a rebellion against Alincia. According to Ludwig, Alincia was weak and unfit to be a leader, so he planned to stage a coup to take Melior, the capital of Crimea, and crown himself king. Bastion instructed Ike and his mercenaries to lay low and stay out of sight, so that they could ambush the rebels if a coup was to be staged. Bastion's advice turned out to be a sound one. When the rebellion eventually broke out, Duke Ludwig attacked Fort Alfea with a large force, but Alincia, along with Joffrey and the Crimean knights, were able to repel the invasion and capture the Duke. However, the rebels had one last trump card, they had captured Lucia, and threatened to execute her if Ludwig was not released. Luckily though, Ike and the Grail mercenaries showed up in the nick of time to rescue Lucia right as she was about to be hanged. Afterwards, they helped defeat the remaining rebel soldiers and thus quell the Crimean Rebellion. After helping Alincia retain the throne, Ike returned home to his headquarters in Crimea, where he met his old friend Ranulf, who told him that another war was brewing, this time between Begnion and the newly formed Lagoose Alliance. After the Lagoose learned that Begnion was involved in the burning of Serenus Forest, which exterminated most of the Heron race, they decided to send envoys to Begnion to investigate. When those envoys were killed by the Begnion Senates, the Lagoose Alliance became enraged and declared war on the Empire, which is why Ranulf had come to ask Ike and the Grail mercenaries to assist them in the conflicts. While Ike was very reluctant to get involved in another war so short after the first one, he eventually accepted, as Galia had helped him out in the war against Ashnard, and he felt he owed them. Unbeknownst to him, however, his previous enemy, the Nation of Dane, had sided with Begnion, meaning he now had to go up against both of them. Ike and the Grail mercenaries, together with the Lagoose, clashed in numerous skirmishes and large-scale conflicts against both Begnion and Dane. He would meet former comrades who had sided with him during the Mad King's War, and he also encountered the leader of the Dane army, Micaiah, who was forced to fight against her better judgement due to a blood contract signed by Senator Lecane, binding her to him, though Ike and the rest of the Gwilym mercenaries were completely unaware of this incident. During one of their many battles against Dane, however, Ike was shocked as he suddenly faced off against his old arch-nemesis, the Black Knight, on the battlefield, during a clash between the Grail mercenaries and the forces of Micaiah, and he learned that the Black Knight was not dead after all. He also learned that the reason he had won their duel in Fort Nados all those years ago was because the Black Knight realized that Ike had not yet reached his full potential, and thus he let him win in hopes that he would continue to grow stronger so that he could challenge him to a real fight in the future. Before leaving, the Black Knight instructed Ike to continue training so that they one day could have their destined duel. Upon learning about the Black Knight's true intentions, Ike was surprised to find that he was not angry, but rather excited at the prospects of finding his old enemy again, ashamed as he was to admit it. As the war escalated further and further, it started to engulf larger portions of Telius by the day. But then, suddenly, disaster struck as the goddess of order, Ashera, awoke from her slumber due to the conflict. As punishment for having broken the peace humanity promised her 150 years ago, she turned almost everyone on the continent into stone. Not everyone succumbed to this curse, however, as Ike, Micaiah, and the rest of their companions were spared the judgement. Why this is the case can only be speculated, as it is never truly touched upon in the story. It could be that Yuna, the goddess of chaos, which awoke from the shackles of Laren's medallion to possess Micaiah, shielded those around her from Ashura's judgement, but there are also others far away from her who did not get turned into statues, so honestly this is anyone's guess. Now united towards a common goal, Ike and Micaiah, under the guidance of Yuna, decided to head towards the Tower of Guidance in Begnion, where Ashera was located, to try and lift the curse somehow. They would be continually opposed by Ashera's minions, the Disciples of Order, at every step, but eventually they made their way to Begnion and located the tower. 
Fighting their way up the many levels of the tower, Ike would once again finally face off against his arch-rival, the Black Knights, who now revealed his identity to be Selgius, supreme general of the Begnian army and former student of General Gawain, Ike's father. In a final fight to the death, Ike faced off against Selgius, and after a long, hard-fought battle, he finally defeated him. As Selgius lay dying on the floor, Ike asked him if he saw his father's shadow in his sword, and Selgius responded that he did. As Selgius passed away, Ike saw his sword, the Allandite, glowing, and upon touching it, he was granted a vision of a suppressed memory. He was there when Grail had murdered his mother Elena, and so was Selgius and his companion Sephiron. However, as Ike was in complete shock, Sephiron used his magic to remove the memory from his mind so that it wouldn't haunt him growing up. After making his peace with his father's killer, Ike would accompany Micaiah to the top floor of the tower and help her defeat Asherah. He struck the final blow against the goddess as Yuna empowered his blade with all her power. As the goddess of order fell to the ground, her curse was lifted, the stone statues returned to life, and the world was at peace once more. Since Radiant Dawn does not feature traditional support conversations, I will choose to focus on what we see during the main story itself, and mainly try to answer one big question which I think is quite relevant to Ike's character, which we will get into later. But first, let's take a look at Ike's evolution since Path of Radiance. In Path of Radiance, Ike was still clearly a young boy, still struggling to find his place in the world. He was constantly troubled with insecurities and doubt as he tried to fill the impossibly large shoes his father left behind. It was revealed that he seldom slept much and that he was constantly afraid of making the wrong decisions. In Radiant Dawn, however, we see an Ike that has fully matured and is now much more confident and collected. He seldom shows hesitation and is quick to jump into action. In many ways, he has really adopted the qualities of his late father and embraced his position as the leader of the Grail mercenaries. One of the questions that I really wanted to answer in this video was one of the things that angered me the most in my initial playthrough of Radiant Dawn. Why did Ike forgive Selgius? While he doesn't specifically say it out loud, they do sort of have a moment together after their fights. Ike even calls Selgius his last teacher, which is really a pardoning statement if you look at it. When I first witnessed this scene during my Let's Play, I was outraged. Some of you guys may remember it. I felt as if Radiant Dawn threw away a very important part of Path of Radiance's plot. Ike should really hate Selgius. He murdered his father and tore their family apart for nothing but his own selfish gains. Yet, after their fight, he forgives him. Why? So, after spending some time researching their origin stories, I have come to the conclusion as to why Ike forgave his father's killer. It's a bit of a speculation, but I figured the spotlight would be a good platform to share my thoughts regardless. After Grail was killed, Ike was thrust into a position he was not ready for, forced to fill his father's shoes as leader of the Grail mercenaries. Ike almost gave in to despair. Each and every day was a struggle for him as he constantly tried to answer a single question. Will I ever live up to my father's image? Grail was to Ike more than just a father. He was this impossibly strong figure, a legendary hero. Ike idolized him and wanted to be just like him, but when Grail was killed, Ike lost any prospects of ever surpassing him. Meanwhile, Selgius had the exact same goal, to surpass Grail. In other words, they both wanted the same thing, to surpass their idol. With Grail gone, however, the only way for them to accomplish this would be through defeating each other. In a way, their fates were intertwined from the very beginning. As Selgius lay dying on the floor, he admits that Ike had, at the very least, matched his father at the height of his glory days, and this is something that puts Ike at ease. In that moment, his insecurities and fears as a young boy leave him for good, and he can finally put his past behind him as a grown man. This is a massive burden that only Selgius can relieve him of, and that's why I believe Ike decided to forgive him. At the end of the day, Selgius took from Ike one of the things he loved the most, but he also gave him a gift that no other man could give him, hence why Ike refers to him as his last teacher. Now before we end this personality segment, I also want to touch upon one other thing, mainly because I know a lot of people are going to pester me in the comment section if I don't at least discuss it, so... Another question that is frequently asked by a lot of fans regarding our Radiant Hero is whether or not he is gay. Because, you know, Ike doesn't have a canonical pairing in Radiant Dawn and that opens up room for all sorts of fanfiction. 
Now, I'm sorry guys, but I am personally not going to give you guys a verdict of whether or not I think Ike is gay or not, because at the end of the day, we don't know, it's really just speculation. But I will say that I can understand the people who have this theory, as Ike do have a habit of rejecting every single female that flirts with him in both games, even very attractive ones like Amy. On top of that, Ike seems to have a rather flirtatious dialogue with Ranulf. I mean, seriously, just look at their lines. They are so incredibly sassy with one another. I certainly reacted to it on my first playthrough and said it was weird, but then again, it could also be a translation thing, we don't know. People also like to point out how close Ike and Soren are, but honestly, I don't see this one at all. I see the bond that Ike and Soren share as more of a brotherly one, but then again, people on the internet loves to make everything gay whenever two male characters as much as show a shred of affection for one another, so I'm not really surprised by this one at all. Many likes to point out that the existence of Priam in Awakening, who is Ike's descendants and even carries the Ragnall to prove it, contradicts the whole Ike is gay theory. But keep in mind that Priam could also be the distant descendant of Mists and still share the same bloodline, so this argument also has some flaws. Also, it's not like gay people can't have biological kids or anything, you know, I'm just saying. At the end of the day, I do find this question a bit silly, as it really doesn't matter much in the grand scheme of things, but I know someone will pester me about it if I don't mention it in this video, so... Yeah, now I have. Hope you guys are happy. And yeah, Ike is totally gay. Since I've already covered everything I know about Ike in the previous spotlight, there won't be a trivia section in this one. I tried looking for Radiant Dawn exclusive Ike facts, but I couldn't really find anyone notable enough to put in the spotlight, aside from, you know, Ike is buff and has muscles. If you know anything you want to share though, then do you feel free to let me know in the comment section below. Ike's ending in Radiant Dawn is strangely simple and leaves a lot to be desired, considering his massive involvement in the story. It is simply stated that he left the continent and traveled to lands unknown, and was never heard from ever again. Depending on who he supports with in the game, however, Ranulf or Soren can accompany him on his travels, but that's about all we know. Father, watch over me. One day I swear. In Radiant Dawn, Ike shows up at the start of Act 3 and is available for most of the chapters in said act, save a couple where you control the opposing side and even face off against him as a boss, which is a bit weird since it's basically like you're fighting yourself. He is available in a few chapters of Act 4 as well, and of course, he is available in the endgame like every other character in the game. Being a main character, Ike is force deployed in every single chapter he is a part of, and he is also the only unit who can land a final blow on the last boss of the game, so using him is pretty mandatory. Luckily, Ike is still a very competent unit in this game, so he isn't hard to use at all. Ike starts out as a level 11 tier 2 unit with strong bases. In particular, he sports high hit points, strength, skill and defense, with average speed and luck, but low resistance. Ike's base speed of 23, while not directly slow, is not quite fast enough to consistently double either, so he badly needs to get a few points in it to reach his full potential. Sadly, Ike does have lower growth rates in Radiant Dawn as opposed to Path of Radiance. He still has very solid strength, skill and defense, but in particular his speed growth of 35% is very shaky, considering it is one of the stats he badly needs the most to grow. There are of course ways to fix this, both stat boosters and bonus experience allows for Ike to get the few extra points of speed he needs, but you could argue that there are so many other characters on your roster which needs this boost more. Needless to say, if you transfer over your save data from Path of Radiance, Ike will get some much needed bonuses to its stats that will really help him out, but this isn't an option for most players. Ike comes into play wielding his brand new personal weapon, the Etard. This sword is basically a silver sword with 5% less accuracy and 10% more crit, which makes it pretty damn good, though it doesn't deal any effective damage to armor knights and cavaliers like the regal sword did in Path of Radiance. Since the Etard sword has 50 uses and you can obtain a second one in Chapter 4 of Act 3, there's really no need to hold back on this one at all. Use it to smash through Ike's enemies as much as he wants. At the beginning of Chapter 11 of Act 3, Ike will get his hands on the Ragnell, and at this point he will pretty much never have need of another weapon ever again, except for one small thing which we'll mention later. With its ranged attack, infinite durability and sky-high might of 18, Ike becomes an absolute juggernaut of destruction on the battlefield, and just like in Path of Radiance, he becomes capable of soloing entire maps by himself as long as he has the sword in his possession. 
Sadly, Ike seems to have forgotten his personal skill from Path of Radiance, either, which is unavailable to him until his first promotion at the end of Act 3. When you obtain it, however, it is every bit as broken as it was in the previous game, pretty much instantly killing anything it procs against and healing Ike to boot, making him very self-sustaining on the front lines. However, against most of the game's endgame bosses, it won't work due to their nihil skill, but it's amazing against their minions. Due to Radiant Dawn's flexible skill system, there are a couple of skills that can work really well on Ike. Counter and Disarm both proc off skill, something Ike has loads of, so they can be considered, although they aren't fantastic for him. Some players might opt to give Ike Adept since he struggles to double naturally, but since Adept procs of speed and Radiant Dawn as opposed to skill in Path of Radiance, it's best given to a faster unit like a Swordmaster who can make much better use of it. Personally, I prefer to give Ike the Dawn skill, as he is usually present on the front lines where all the scary enemies are located, where he can debuff their hit and crit rates. However, a skill that will really shine on Ike is Blossom. Ike only has 9 levels total to grow in Act 3 and will usually reach his level cap before his first promotion, so Blossom's increased growth rates at the cost of reduced EXP is usually a very nice trade-off for him and will certainly help him patching up his very shaky speed. In the endgame portion of Chapter 4, on the second floor of the Tower of Guidance, Ike will have his one-on-one -on -one duel with the Black Knight, with the wall of plot preventing other characters from helping him. The Black Knight may appear as this super intimidating badass due to the story portraying him as super strong, but in reality, this duel isn't all that hard to win. Even if your Ike somehow is stat screwed, he begins the chapter standing on a cover tile which boosts his defense by 10 points, giving him a very big advantage against the Black Knights. Note that his opponent is also occupying one of these tiles at the start of the battle, however, but if you simply wait and let him come to you on the first turn, which he will do, he will lose this bonus. While the Wall of Plot blocks ranged heal staves, it does not block support bonuses, so if you want to have someone stand on the other side of it to buff Ike, you can, though I find it better to have him situated on the cover tile in the middle. Also, before this fight starts, you definitely want to make sure you have equipped the Nihil skill on Ike, unless you want to get eclipsed by the Black Knights. However, on difficulties above easy mode, the Black Knight will come with the Imbue skill, which makes him heal for 17 hit points at the start of every turn. So if your Ike doesn't have the required 34 speed to double attack, it can be a bit tricky to outdamage this healing, but it will happen eventually, it will just take some time. However, this allows you to grind on the Disciples of Order and obtain the Wishblade from Lavelle in the meanwhile, so it's not really a bad thing. If you don't like wasting time, however, there is a very simple solution which makes this fight an absolute cakewalk. Ike's promotion to Vanguard gives him an instant A rank in Axis, allowing him to wield the hammer. Since the Black Knight is considered an armored unit, Ike can at base with the hammer 3 shot or in most cases 2 shot him. Of course, you only get 2 hammers over the course of Radiant Dawn, so if you've broken both of them already, this is not a viable option, but even without it, this shouldn't be a hard fight for you to win at all. Against the final boss, Ashura, Ike needs to be the one landing the final blow to kill her, or else she will heal up to full and you'll need to fight her all over again. Once you initiate a successful attack with Ike, the cinematic will begin playing, letting you know that the fight is over. In Radiant Dawn, we see Ike all grown up, from the scared young boy in Path of Radiance to a brave commander in the present game. While Radiant Dawn doesn't have traditional support conversations, Ike does have more exposure in the game due to him being a main character. It's quite refreshing to see a more adult version of him, and it's easy to see his father's examples and virtues shining through his character, as he has in many ways become a young version of Grail. I maintain my rating of 4 out of 5 stars because Ike is still the same character, just more grown up. One of Ike's most notable differences in Radiant Dawn is his extremely muscular build and bulky physique. In fact, it's so prevalent that it's basically become a meme in the fandom at this point. Ike not only fights for his friends, but obviously also for protein shakes and supplements. While his attire is very much the same, he certainly looks like a real hero now. Honestly, there's nothing more for me to do than to rate him the same 4 out of 5 stars as I gave him in the last one. Buff, Ike is buff. Before I review Radiant Dawn Ike's utility, I'd like to respond to some criticism that I faced in the last spotlight. A lot of people reacted strongly to me calling Ike a good unit in Path of Radiance, and I got a lot of pushback from people in the comment section saying that a sword-locked, non-mounted unit should not ever be rated 4 out of 5 stars. 
While I in hindsight realize that he should have been rated a little lower, I still stand by my argument that Ike is a very solid unit in Path of Radiance. First of all, he's force deployed, so you're pretty much stuck with him as a unit, so benching him isn't an alternative. Secondly, enemies in Path of Radiance are really weak. I mean, aside from Maniac mode, which like 1% of players have played. So it's much easier to train him as opposed to some of the other games which feature sword-locked lords and tougher opponents, like Fire Emblem 6 and Fire Emblem 12. I know that an easy difficulty and being force deployed doesn't directly make him better as a unit, but I still find that those two things makes it much easier for him to gain experience to the point where his solid lord growth rates can turn him into a damage dealing machine. In hindsight though, he didn't deserve 4 stars, so I will budge on that. Path of Radiance Ike is 3 stars at best. Radiant Dawn Ike, while starting out much the same as his Path of Radiance counterpart, being a sword-locked, foot-locked, force-deployed unit, does get to play around with the Ragnall for a lot longer than he did in the previous game, having the weapon available to him in a grand total of 10 chapters. While pre-Ragnall Ike is a 3-star unit at the most, I'd argue that post-Ragnall Ike is easily a 4-star unit, so that's the rating I'll give him. I'm grateful to you. You've done so much for me. You are a true friend. Thank you so much for watching this Fire Emblem character spotlight. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider helping out this video with a like and let me know what character you want to see me feature in a future spotlight by leaving a comment below. Before we end this video, I want to give a massive shout out to my amazing Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I really appreciate each and every one of you. You make it possible for me to produce all this Fire Emblem content for you all on a daily basis, especially now that YouTube is demonetizing videos left, right and center for seemingly no reason at all. If you become a Patreon supporter today, you get instant access to my Patreon-only Discord chat, the ability to participate in Patreon hangouts and ask questions for my Patreon Q&A videos. Also, if you become a Silver Tier Patreon, you can request your very own Fire Emblem character spotlight, alongside a drawing of your favorite Fire Emblem character done personally by my designer. You can check out her Instagram or Facebook page by clicking the link in the video description to see some of the work she's done previously. She is extremely talented. Also, my two script readers, Sonagi and Heliasan, helped me with the fine-tuning of the script of the spotlight, along with Mecha, who also assists with correcting errors and mistakes. Anyway, that's all for now. If you want to see more spotlights, check out the playlist linked in front of you. There's also another direct link which will take you to the previous spotlight I did. Anyway, my name is Finmangs, thank you for watching all the way to the end, you are a true fan. Don't forget to leave that like, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.